Good evening, my friends. Thank you again for being with me as we make our continuing study of Reformation and Restoration. I guess it's down here too, isn't it? Tonight we're going to, uh, last time was an introduction, and tonight we're, we're going to really start delving into some very important material as we compare the Reformation movement with the Restoration process. And uh, as I told you last time, we need to remember that church history is a process, not a date. And in so doing, we begin to take ourselves away from things that would be very man-driven and begin recognizing things that are man-driven, but the process more than just a point in time or, if you will, rewritten history as Catholicism likes to do, and I'm convinced even Cal Calvinism likes to do. Tonight we're going to talk about there it is. John Calvin, Pope of the Reformation Movement. Now let me add a little disclaimer. I've never heard him called that before. I think I made that up myself, but it seems to fit. And I think you'll understand why I make such a statement as we continue through this particular lesson. So tonight, Reformation and Restoration, let's talk about John Calvin. You're saying to yourself, what about Luther? I'll deal with him, but let's just deal with this one step at a time. All right, here, don't push me. First thing we always do is we try to give you these five questions so that you can screenshot it, and then you can use that as kind of a fill in the blanks as you're going along if you're part of the Restoration School of Biblical Studies, or if you're just studying on your own. So there they are. Screenshot that. You got them? All right, let's dive into this. Before we actually meet some of the major playing characters of uh, the Reformation movement. Um, let me ask a question that has been posed to me uh, many times in the past. In fact, I was in a debate with a friend just this week. With He's a Calvinist, and, and uh, it got a little dicey as we were talking about some things. And um, this particular individual just wanted to say, look, Calvinist or not, we're all brothers. Sounds a lot like Oprah Winfrey. You know, we're all going to heaven by different routes. And I challenge that by saying, well, you know, really that's not your call, and it's not my call to make. God will tell us who's in the family and who's not in the family. And just because we have all the niceties of tolerance, the woke doctrines of our culture today, that doesn't necessarily make it true. It doesn't make it factual. And so I ask you this question. Wouldn't it be better for us to just focus on unity and tolerance and just kind of let some of this stuff go? I mean, from a human standpoint, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Sonny, stop rocking the boat. Sonny, stop bringing up all of these issues. Sonny, if we could just, you know, people who claim to be Christians, let's just all gather together. Think about it, the world, how much better a place it would be. And yet, if you study the first century church, you'll recognize that that's not their approach. Although they called folks into the church, wanted them to be part of the church, if they refused to do that, their fellowship with those people was greatly limited. If they decided to become part of the church and then they went off into apostasies, false doctrines such as Calvinism, Catholicism, Gnosticism, those kind of things, they were called on the carpet for that and, and fellowship was broken. Even in the first century, the movement was about the purity of the truth, not, hey, let's just compromise so we can get along. Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23 is probably one of the most disturbing passages in all of the Bible. Because it describes individuals who on the last days, last at judgment, are, they feel like they're, they're bound for heaven. They, they, they feel like that they're a shoe in. And they haven't paid attention to the line of Jesus when he says that, you know, that uh, few there be that find it. They just have this confidence in themselves. You'll see this in the passage. And they're going to be rejected. I suggest to you, these folks described in Matthew chapter 7 are... Calvinists of our present day. Now, I'm not suggesting there was Calvinism back in the day. I, there were the false teachings of Calvinism as far as the drawing in that particular direction. But Calvinism obviously doesn't come about until Calvin is born and, and begins to reign in very cruel reign as, that, as far as that is concerned. But in Matthew chapter 7, he, he's addressing individuals who have come to the conclusion via man-made doctrines, we must be okay we got to be a shoe in Let's look at the passage. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who ones who only the one who does the will of my Father. Hold on to that phrase; it's underlined there for a reason. Uh, uh, who's in heaven? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles, many miracles? Then I'll tell you them plainly: I never knew you away from me, you evil doer, evil doers. The reason it's such a dis it's a disturbing passage is because notice what these folks are doing in Jesus' name. They're not doing it in the name of Lucifer or anybody else. In Jesus' name, they're driving out demons. In Jesus' name, they are prophesying. In Jesus' name, they are performing miracles. Sound like good people. And yet, you notice the conclusion, verse 23, those folks are going to be told, I never knew you away from you evildoers. And so you ask yourself, what in the world? These are folks who are prophesying, casting out demons, and doing miracles in the name of Jesus, and they're not going to make it. How in the world is that possible? Well, now go back up to what I alluded to earlier, the, the part that's underlined. The reason they're tossed out is because they are not ones who are doing the will of the Father. They're doing their will. They're doing the doctrines of men, the things that men, mankind has come up with as being essential. They're taking the path of human reasoning and rationale, but they didn't do the will of the Father. One of the primary foundational pillars to the Restoration School of Biblical Studies is that God is more than capable of presenting his own message and then interpreting his own message for us. And so unlike Catholicism that has that pillar, or those three pillars you might recall of the stool, the, the three-legged stool, and one was what, magisterium, that's the hierarchy of the church, another is the history of the church, and then the middle one is Scripture. Two out of three of the pillars of, of Catholicism, as far as authority is concerned, two out of three of them are based upon humanity, based upon mankind's rationale. But notice what Matthew chapter 7 says. Man's ra rationale came to the conclusion, we've got to be a shoe in because we have prophesied, cast out demons, and done miracles in the name of Jesus. And yet, they are called evildoers, and they're cast out. Why? Because they relied on human wisdom, human rationale, the doctrines of men, just like Calvinism does. They did not do the will of the Father. Come down to Romans chapter 16. Watch out, Paul will say. Watch out for those who cause divisions. We'll come back to that. And create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that uh, you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. I want you to notice that he mentions here that we need to watch out because there's some folks coming down the path, and they, they're going to cause divisions. You might say, Sonny, isn't that exactly what you're doing? I mean, you spent the entire last semester talking about Catholicism and the Antichrist, and now you're continuing into the Reformation movement by pointing out the flaws and the failures of, uh, of Calvinism. Aren't you the one that's causing divisions? Sure. But that's not who he's referring to in Romans chapter 8. In Romans oh, Excuse me. In Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter 16, excuse me. In Romans chapter 16, he's talking about individuals who are causing divisions because they're drawing people to them, their own selfishness. I don't want anybody to follow after me. In fact, I caution you right up front, don't follow after me. I am frail, I am weak, I'm a sinner, I am not uh, wise in a lot of areas. If I don't give you scripture, if I don't put scripture in front of you, the will of God in front of you, then I beg of you, turn and walk the other direction. It's just not worth it. Watch out for those who cause divisions. Specifically, he's talking about divisions that are obstacles contrary to the doctrine. The doctrine of who? The doctrine that you've been taught through the Holy Spirit, not the doctrines of men, as you see being played out in in Catholicism, and then further played out through the Pope Calvin in Calvinism. And so, would it be better for us to focus on unity and tolerance, not in this situation? Because I am convinced that Calvinists are leading many, through smooth talk and flattery, down a path that is destined for the Matthew 7, 23, away from me, you evildoers. This has to be exposed. And that's why we're on the journey. All right. 
I want to review just real quickly with regards to where we have been uh, with regards to the timeline. Again, you'll notice there's not a single date on there because I'm not interested in dating things. I'm interested in the process. What is this? Right here. Right there. Yeah, right there. Right there. Church history is a process, not a date. Not long after the church began, they fell into apostasy, many of them. In fact, you begin to read uh, and read, read through the New Testament, and you find out that most of the letters that are written contain some level of admonishment, most of them actually a primary theme of admonishment, get back to God, get back to the message of Jesus. So apostasy was clear. Catholicism capitalized upon that apostasy, and they began to move even deeper into the darkness. And as you see those white lines pointing back to the Lord's church, I, I'd like for them to represent the various movements throughout church history of individuals whose consciences were pricked by the perversion of the hierarchy of the church, that they they were going off in directions, as Paul even predicted with regards to the Ephesian elders, what is it, Acts chapter 20, that after he left, that savage wolves would come in among them from their own number. They would draw people away after themselves, and that's, that's Catholicism. But even back in that day, there were many individuals who rejected that, and they, they were pushing against that, and they wanted to restore, not reform. Now, let's again define those two terms. You see that paint? painted, what is this? I don't know what it is. It looks like a, a, the side of a building or something, but you got that, uh, maybe it's a deck, but you, you got that scraper tool and they've scraped up some of it. But Reformation is that little piece of white paint. Underneath the gray, next layer is white. That's Reformation, taking it back to a position that we are comfortable with. Restoration is the naked wood all the way at the bottom, taking it back to a position that God is comfortable with. The problem, the main problem, the primary problem of the Reformation movement is that they weren't interested in going back to God's pattern. They were interested in reforming it back to a position where they were comfortable. That was the largest problem that Luther had with regards to his 95 Thesis. Let's, uh, let's go to that screen. You notice I circle Reformation because what we're going to do over the next several lessons is we're going to actually zone in on this idea of Reformation. But you're going to be perhaps a little surprised to find out that we're not going to linger on Martin Luther. Martin Luther is called the father of the Reformation movement. And so I suppose if you're going to give somebody credit or blame with regards to not wanting to go all the way back to God and restore, but just simply to reform, you'd give that title, that you'd give that responsibility to, to Martin Luther. But the fact of the matter is that there was a younger contemporary to Martin Luther, and his name was John Calvin. And he really steals the show. That's why I refer to him as the Pope of the Reformation movement. Because John Calvin takes off in a, in a, in a way that uh, Luther never did. And in his perverse, egotistical drive to, uh, to make the church what he wants it to be, to reform it back to what Calvin wants it to be, not what God wants it to be, but what Calvin wants it to be, he... He, he contrasted himself greatly with Martin Luther. Luther started with a gracious God, and then he went on to determine that, then he, just, he decided that that God went on to determine everything. Calvin, on the other hand, he starts off with a God who's de who determines everything, and then goes on to limit his graciousness. We'll see that in the, in the tulip. Two very, very different approaches to reforming the legalistic apostasy of the Catholic Church. Neither is correct, but both of them des desired to take the church back to a place where they felt comfortable. Neither of them, it seems, had any desire or drive to take it back to a place where God felt comfortable. And that's the problem. But I want you to know that Calvin quickly takes over the limelight with regards to the Reformation movement. He is going to be the guy who is going to drive the ship towards what he wants the church to be. And so, unfortunately, in this lesson, we're going to have to spend a little bit of time <coughs> talking about the history of John Calvin so that you can understand its roots and know why today there is such an egotistical pursuit of cherry-picking with regards to Scripture to back up 
man-made doctrines and make them primary because folks in the Reformation movement aren't interested really in God's will. They're interested in reforming it, tweaking it, bringing it back to where they are comfortable. So, unfortunately, here we go. John Calvin was born on July 10th, 1509. I told you I wasn't going to have any dates, but I felt like in this particular case you might be interested to be able to track this guy if you wanted to do a little research on your own. He was born in France, as you can see there. He was originally trained as a humanist lawyer. He attended the University of Paris, the University of Orleans, the University of Burgess. He is described as a theologian as well as an ecclesiastical statement. State, statesman, not statement. Ecclesiastical statesman. <clears throat> I want you to take that phrase that's underlined there and hold on to it because that's going to play into his dualistic approach to forcing, cramming his desires for reformation down the throats of his followers. Remember, we're still in a time period where they were quick to follow after leaders. Many people couldn't read. Many folks were not educated like Calvin and Luther and others, and so they depended upon others, and the Catholic Church wanted it to be that way. Calvin was thrilled to take advantage of that, and so Calvin is going to now begin cherry-picking his way through Scripture, developing his own doctrines with regards to who he thinks God is and what he thinks the Church should be. Calvin wrote many commentaries, uh, many books, etc. You can see the one there, it's most often published. Later in life, Calvin re reigned as both a religious and civil authority over Geneva, Switzerland. You know, that, that word reigned is there by intent. He was a cruel, dictatorial, and torturous leader. He, he demanded uh, doctrinal submission. He actively pursued the power of excommunication in order to punish those who disagreed with him. Within the first five years of his rule in Geneva, over 50 dissenters were executed and over 70 were exiled for their beliefs. This largely is attributed to the egotistical push of Calvin not to restore, but to reform. Reform, again, means to take it back to a level that he was comfortable with. The church needs to be this, because I say so. And so they took it back to a level, a level of Calvin's desires. And then you see the conclusion of his life there in 1564. The reason we're dealing with Calvin right now is because of a, a little quote I heard some years ago as I was debating many Calvinists, and a statement was made that I find to be very powerful, true, disturbing, and that is, the most influential preacher of our day is John Calvin. The reason I found that statement to be troublesome is because, as you can see, John Calvin hasn't been alive for many, many years. 1564, he died and was separated from God, I'm convinced. As you understand that, and you begin to put it all together, how can John Calvin be the most influential preacher of our day? That person went on to claim that Calvin, in many respects, is more influential than Jesus Christ. That I buy. In my lengthy study of Calvinism over the years, and by the way, I've, that's my little book right there that I have, I have published on the subject, in my lengthy study of Calvinism, one of the things that I have noted is their desire to be of him. Sometimes they'll say they don't want to be called Calvin, Calvinistic, but they won't reject his principles. They won't reject his teachings. They go so far, and this is the thing that's perhaps as troublesome as anything, they go so far as to filter everything through what he says. So they start with Calvinism, then they make the Bible fit Calvinism, not unlike Catholicism. Calvin reigned as an egotistical religious authority. Under his reign, people were executed. Under his reign, people were coerced and forced into the doctrinal conditions. And today he is still among the most quoted, the most influential preachers of our day. In fact, I would tell you, as I, as I have studied this, that most of Christendom is influenced by Calvin to a great, great degree. Most of Christendom, those folks who, who call themselves Christians, are actually very dedicated to his principles. Now, you need to understand up front that there is no Church of Calvin. You don't find that, okay? Calvin goes much deeper than that because Calvinism is a cancer. Calvinism is a per 
permeating power that, that wiggles its way in between various subject matters. So much so that people who are dedicated and loyal to certain doctrines don't even realize that those are Calvinistic doctrines. I'll show you that in the, at the, in the conclusion when we deal with the tulip. And some of you are going to say, oh, I believe that. And if you do, understand it's largely because of Calvin, and it's not because of Christ. We're going to show that in the continuance of this series. Well, again, a little bit more of Calvin, forgive me, but one of the things that happened with Calvin earlier on is he had a problem with predestination. His followers struggled with it because if Calvin's view of predestination is correct, then none of us can really know that we're saved, 1 John 5 and 13. It was troublesome. And so his, his followers pushed him, you know, well, how can we, John, how can we know? Calvin addressed this uncertainty by suggesting that works do not lead to salvation, but they are evidences of one's salvation. I want you to think about that. Works don't lead you to salvation, but they are evidence that you are saved. The harder one works, the more prosperous he becomes. The more prosperous he becomes, the more assurance he can have of his own election. Now, the, problem, the reason with that the problem with that is, what do you do with folks who suffered all their life? You know. Go back to Jesus himself. It seems to me that the closer he got to his end, more, if you will, more spiritual as far as developing his, his people, the less prosperous he became. Doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I, but I'll give you an example. When, when asked how they know that they have eternal life, 1 John 5 and 13, a Calvinist is sure to point to his high standard or the high standard of his people have often had them, as I've debated them, often had them brag on, well, our congregation does this and our people do that. They're most certainly going to point to their high standard of, of morality, etc., etc., with regards to themselves and their church, and they offer that as proof of their election. Sad part of that is that that's not what God suggests is proof of our election. We'll talk about that at length when we get to that particular topic in our discussion of Calvinism. Though Calvin's view of predestination insists that God controls all, it also insists that man has the responsibility to prove his election by his own good works. That's a point that many would call a contradiction. And I, the guy with his hand up, I happen to be one of those. The tulip is Calvin's claim to fame, if you want to call it that. Interestingly enough, the tulip wasn't really validated, if you will, until after his death. But what took place was that Calvin started such a powerful movement that once Calvin is dead uh, and people began to challenge what was going on with Scripture and, and suggesting that cherry-picking should not be allowed, the Calvinists got their heads together and, and they decided they really needed to summarize what Calvin and his doctrines stood for, his doctrines stood for. And so they came up with this cute little word, tulip. And um, as, you, as you read it, you, you see that each of the letters represents a phrase or an idea. T is for total depravity. It is the absolute most important foundational bedrock uh, level of Calvinism. Without it, the rest of the, the house of cards falls on its face. Total depravity. Evil babies. We inherit the sin of Adam. And so... You're evil from the start. Unconditional election. You don't have any choice about whether or not you're saved or unsaved. God did all that before you were ever born. And so really it's just playing out as God wants it to play out. Limited atonement. Jesus did not die for everyone. So John 3.16, you got to reinterpret that. Irresistible grace. Once you're saved, you really become a puppet. And so all of the worship from that point on is puppeteered by God. So God essentially exists in an echo chamber, listening to himself, puppeteer us into praising him. Perseverance of the saints is actually once saved, always saved. The idea that you can't walk away from your salvation. I want you to see the, the extreme nature of this doctrine of Calvin. We're not depraved, we're totally depraved. Now, I believe we're depraved. I really do. I believe that the world is depraved. But totally depraved would suggest that you're an evil baby when born. And I just don't buy that. And I'll prove to you why you shouldn't, as well as we continue in this series. 
election. I believe in election. Scripture plainly teaches that. I, I don't believe that Calvinists actually understand what election means. But unconditional election, mm, it stands in contrast to the fact that we are called to confirm our election. Confirm our calling and election. Limited atonement, as we've already talked about, the perversion of that whole idea that Jesus didn't die for everybody. Irresistible grace. You see the extreme nature of that? And then once saved, always saved. Calvinism is an, an extreme reactionary kind of a uh, series of doctrines. You might ask yourself why. And really, if you think it through, it's not hard to figure it out. For many, many years, the church has lived under the horrible manipulation of, of Catholicism. So much so that People have been manipulated into giving up their life savings to help buy a loved one out of purgatory. Or they, uh, they have funded great massive cathedrals. Uh, they, they have gone to great lengths to self-punish. To self Go to the priest. The priest says you've got to say so many Hail Marys, etc. It, it, it became a, a perverted very much a perverted apostasy of what Christ had set up. And folks were striking out against that. So what Calvin does is he, as we used to say here in Northeast Arkansas, he fell in the ditch on the other side of the road. He didn't bring him back to a happy medium. He reacted to the legalism of Catholicism by creating his own doctrines of, if you will, we're so totally depraved, there's nothing we can do. Catholicism would suggest almost that you can save yourself through confessions, etc. Calvinism would suggest there's absolutely nothing you can do to contribute to your salvation. And yet Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says that his spirit testifies with our spirit that we are a child of God, meaning that there has to be a partnership. So you got Catholicism in the ditch on one side of the road. you got Calvinism in the ditch on the other side of the road. You and I need to find the happy medium, Romans 8 16, where you and I enter into a partnership with God. That's what this series will be about as we unravel the perversion of the tulip. However, before we leave it tonight, I want you to see Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. This is very important. This people honors me at their list, but their heart is far from me. Why? Well, because they teach the doctrines or the commandments of men. You'll notice in verse 9, it specifically says they worship in vain. And the reason is because they're teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. Reformation means we want to teach the doctrines of men or tweak the church to come back to a position where I am now comfortable. Restoration means, doesn't matter whether I'm comfortable or not, we're going to take it back to what God says needs to happen. That will be the grand contrast between these two pursuits, to reform it or restore it. And we're going to find with regards to Calvinism, as he as Calvinism represents really the heart of, of, Reform of the Reformation movie, not Luther so much as Calvin. As we see this play out before us, we're going to notice that the doctrines of men become primary. The cherry-picking of Scripture at the expense of the harmony of God's Word is going to be primary. And in the process, they are going to tweak the church back to a level that Calvin was comfortable with, not that Christ established. Here are the five questions we tried to cover. Next week, we're not going to cover so much about Calvin, because I'm sorry I even had to do that. But you're going to see in coming weeks how his character, his nature, plays into the tulip and the, the manipulation of Scripture, the cherry-picking that goes on. You're going to see the egotistical nature of Calvin play out and what happens with, with regards to Calvinism. So anyhow, there are the five questions that uh, I, I leave with you to study on your own and to fill those things out. If you're part of the School of Biblical Studies, you'll receive an email at the end of the week and you now have all the answers. Thanks for being with me. I look forward to continuing our study together. This is Sonny Chow saying, be there, Matthew 16, 26.